Okay. So I, uh, we're already a little bit late and we have great presentations. So I am going to fly through this first part uh, and just give you a little bit of an introduction over the last couple of years um, of where we've been working in DHIS2 in the space of uh, disease surveillance, cross-sector data sharing, early warning and response. So this is a little bit, this is our bread and butter. This is where most countries actually start uh, using DHIS2 with their indicator-based surveillance because for them, it was just natural. It starts mainly at the facility. They report on everything else. So why not report on my IDSR as well? And this is really, really scale. So more than 41 countries at this point, um, about 20 of them prior to COVID. And since COVID, we have now seen the adoption for integrated disease surveillance uh, go up substantially. Many of you are familiar with our, our WHO toolkit for this, um, some of the ways we support this type of surveillance data with the thresholds, outbreak alerts, automated dashboards, um, this uh, core standard metadata from WHO has already been defined for about 15 diseases to support standardization. And of course, we have both aggregate and case-based reporting modes. So countries typically use a combination of these in order to get what they need. But thinking back to the AFRO guidelines for IDSR, event-based surveillance has always been that pillar. And then we've forgotten about that pillar for quite a while. But coming out of the COVID emergency again, what we're seeing is that countries that have now really started to strengthen their foundation, digitize the indicator-based surveillance, they've realized that EBS is a huge part of this early warning. So there are uh, several countries, you'll hear from some, I think Tanzania today, about how they use uh, kind of DHIS2 for event-based surveillance in the country level. But there has also been work with the Africa CDC and partners at His South Africa in establishing a continental-wide uh, event-based surveillance system. And this is very much also um, in line with, it is meant to complement and feed into other systems and tools, including WHO's EIOS. So the EIOS being um, uh, epidemic intelligence from open sources. Um, so we see country, regional, global level all working together. For health emergency preparedness and response, we just had a bit of a, a conversation out in the hallway with many of our colleagues from WHO Health Emergencies. We've talked a little bit with some of these colleagues over the years where there is not such a, there should not be such a dichotomy between your routine and your emergency. Your routine surveillance, it is ongoing all the time so that you can actually detect an emergency very quickly. Um, but then what we saw from countries is how much they actually leverage DHIS2 as a part of that response. So 59 countries were adopting, extending DHIS2 as part of the COVID-19 response strategy. This also included vaccine rollouts, for example. So the power of an integrated platform to get different sources of disease uh, data and as well as the response. Uganda had a presentation on Monday sharing with us they have established DHIS2 as a national uh, EIDSR since 2013, gradually, slowly building this up. Um, and they actually, in the most recent outbreak, 2022, they used this system, they used this SMS uh, reporting tool that they had, that community workers, that the public was aware of, in order to actually do uh, signal management. So get those signals early on from the community of a suspected case, make sure they were being triaged, verified, moving to the appropriate district officer. And if it met those case definitions, it meant sending out uh, an ambulance team, isolating that case and linking them with treatment. Points of entry, this was actually uh, his Sri Lanka and the Sri Lanka before anyone else really did something DHIS2 uh, for COVID-19. They actually established this at their airports to start monitoring travelers. Um, and this really started to pick up. So the combination of DHIS2 is an extensible system. You can build apps on top of it. We do have support for offline capability. Um, these points of entry were, were places where you can add new actors who are collecting data, integrating it into this system. Uh, this example is also from Uganda, where they have more than 60 land borders, and it was really important for them to keep trade open during this emergency, uh, but also being able to, to track and monitor the people crossing those borders and make sure uh, that if one of them turned up positive, they could also appropriately respond. DHIS2 for rumor monitoring. So this is from Mozambique. Now, I understand that rumor monitoring, sometimes it can be very similar to event-based surveillance. In this particular case, it was a lot about understanding uh, vaccine hesitancy, monitoring rumors to understand what kind of targeted public health communications do I need to have uh, with those people. However, from a functional perspective, this 
concept of rumor monitoring is very, very similar to event-based surveillance. And so as a software platform, we spend a lot of time looking across all of these different use cases and saying, how can we make the generic features there? How can we make them possible for you to use in many different ways? We have some new work emerging with uh, USCDC on rapid response team rostering. This also builds on lessons learned already with some basic solutions that countries have done um, for just trying to understand and manage and roster their community health workers. So again, we are um, building things based on what's already worked and what's been in the field. Lastly, cross-sector data sharing. We are working with uh, WAWA, with FAO, uh, with countries to understand how animal health human health can cross-share data with one another. We have new initiatives, climate and climate-sensitive disease surveillance data. So I invite you back to this room at 1 p.m. where you'll actually have a presentation about what we're doing in this space. And then everything for us comes back to triangulation, integrated systems, not just for effectiveness, but also for efficiency. When you have 100 platforms and you don't have the resources to manage 100 platforms, you have fragmented data everywhere. So we have worked very closely with Afro and others um, to see how can we bring these different data sources together, develop these triangulation dashboards, and these are used as part of response. Campaigns sometimes target areas of low doses, but sometimes they are reactive because something has happened. There is a meningitis case. Now we need to launch a campaign, and I can't do that until I have that lab data. So everything comes together. Mortality surveillance, this is a key part of routine health information systems. In COVID-19, a lot of this was used to do these excess uh, mortality calculations. So again, we cannot think about this disease surveillance data in a silo. We have to think about how we bring this platform together. And so with that, I will hand over to uh, Stefano and the remaining colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So we decided to start directly with the presentation uh, with this, this overview about uh, these huge thematics, because I mean, so we can spend entirely an entire week uh, discussing about surveillance, discussing about another week, discussing about One Health, another week. So thank you very much, Rebecca, for this very insightful uh, introduction. I will now ask um, Will Bauer from uh, CDC Atlanta. He's going to provide us a presentation about the creation and implementation of a district health information software on uh, the surveillance for viral zoonotic disease. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? No? Good? I never tell. Yeah, no problem. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks, Stefano, for uh, the introduction. Uh, my name is Bill Boyer. I'm working at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, in their Division of Global Health Protection. Uh, and as Rebecca touched on, um, just briefly, um, we are working with them uh, and uh, other agencies on a uh, zoonosis surveillance package uh, within DHIS2 um, as, as part of a toolkit. Um, and I will be discussing that today. I'm good to go. Okay. Good. There we go. Uh, so as a little bit of a background, um, we have a five-year cooperative agreement uh, with the University of Oslo um, to fund toolkit development uh, and country-level uh, HISP organizations that are involved in this work. Um, and the purpose of this toolkit uh, would be to um, integrate human and animal health surveillance uh, by formalizing and digitizing 
response communication between those sectors um, for early warning, for improved response, uh, and for uh, upward reporting of both sectors. Um, additional goals of this toolkit would be to provide uh, ministries of agriculture, ministries of wildlife and fisheries, uh, livestock as well, um, and all of those in the animal health sector with the same uh, resources um, and infrastructure that is available to the human health sector uh, in countries. And we also want to uh, build this into cur current surveillance infrastructures within countries. Um, we don't wanna create something completely separate and require uh, duplicate data entry, things like that. So this is something meant to integrate these surveillance uh, structures uh, within a country. Um, and these are expressed gaps and expressed needs that um, have led to uh, the initiation of this project. Um, some of these gaps, um, as you may be familiar with, with uh, One Health Surveillance overall, um, is that informal communication across sectors. A lot of it is paper-based. A lot of it is phone calls, SMS, um, which may work, you know, one-off uh, instances, but wouldn't necessarily work in a uh, epidemic scenario. Um, and so uh, with this project, we're hoping to digitize that communication that already exists and make it formal and take out kind of the human error component um, of that cross-sector uh, communication, um, leading to you know, early warning response um, and uh, hopefully data sharing across sectors with uh, joint investigations. Um, and so I know, you know this project is right now focused on human and animal health integration, um, but of course there are other disciplines, other sectors that are important um, like uh, environmental health. Um, and that is something that we're you know, considering as the project progresses, but we're really just starting um, at the intersection of human and animal health uh, sectors right now. And this is what we would want to be included uh, in a toolkit. This is an ongoing um, project. This is not something that has been completed, so the toolkit is not um, you know, available yet, but uh, it is something we are currently working on. And these are the goals here, uh, dashboards and visualizations, uh, maps and analyses, uh, minimum data elements and reporting requirements within uh, this toolkit. Um, but the big one that I'll be talking about today and something that we've been as a, as a group focusing on more recently with our uh, resources is the notification and data sharing um, across, why is this in the way, across sectors. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, we would include data collection um, and investigation tools uh, within this uh, toolkit. So this is um, just a diagram to kind of visualize how this toolkit would fit into um, current surveillance infrastructures within a country. Um, so on the left, you have the uh, animal health uh, surveillance hierarchy. Um, and I'll explain uh, the tools uh, here in a minute um, in the animal health sector, but you may be familiar with uh, EMAI, uh, an emphasis of uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, and uh, on the right, we have uh, the human health sector and the public health sector. Um, and you see in the middle uh, at national level, uh, we have the DHIS2 One Health uh, Zoonotic Disease Module. Um, and this would fit into where DHIS2 uh, currently fits in uh, countries that use it. Um, and the reporting mechanisms that would be here would, would be what is currently in a country. So it's not, as I was saying, something that's completely separate um, and something that would, that would cause uh, data uh, duplication and, and uh, additional reporting. Um, and so the idea would be a zoonotic disease event could occur on either sector, could derive uh, from the human health sector or the animal health sector first at the community level. They would go through their normal reporting requirements upwards to in the human health sector, DHIS2, or emphasize in the animal health sector. Um, and then those, the, the big goal of this project is to integrate those two surveillance systems at national and subnational level to share data um, for early warning and for uh, um, you know, joint reporting. Um, so as I mentioned, we are collaborating with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations or, or FAO, um, and they have two um, uh, surveillance infrastructures and systems that we are hoping to integrate with. Uh, Empresai is a uh, event-based uh, surveillance system that is maintained by the FAO. You can see their uh, international landing page here, um, and they do have a, sim uh, a similar infrastructure as DHIS2, 
um, which is, uh, and a lot of other organizations, they have national uh, surveillance systems um, and national uh, databases that are owned by the country. So you don't see necessarily a lot of, uh, of these little dots on, on and events on this map um, because it's not necessarily required to be reported up to their international landing page, um, but they do own their data at the national level. And that's where really this intervention would take place. Um, and we're also collaborating with them uh, on uh, the general toolkit um, and country projects uh, that I'll be talking about um, in a little bit. Um, and of course, they have the technical expertise uh, in uh, the animal health sector. Um, and so that is why, uh, again, it's crucial that uh, they're involved in this project. And of course, uh, why I'm here, we are collaborating with the University of Oslo and HISP organizations, um, utilizing their uh, uh, established global network, you can see on this map, of course, and, and their robust and modifiable software that will be needed to you know, work in this one health space that is complicated. Um, and we are mirroring uh, packages and toolkits uh, that have already been created and published uh, and made available on uh, DHIS2's webpage. Um, and we are, of course, collaborating with uh, their developers to create this software um, that can be modifiable uh, for countries to use for, for their One Health surveillance. Um, and we will be uh, implementing these uh, with them um, moving forward with, uh, with country projects. So I've mentioned uh, country projects a few times. Um, we want to create something that is useful, um, that is effective for these countries. And with that, we need to understand what the needs are at the local level. We don't wanna create something just sitting from our desks, you know, thousands of miles away. Um, and so we have been engaging in a couple of country projects, one in uh, Tanzania um, that has gone on for um, almost a year now, and one uh, in uh, Guinea that uh, is just now uh, starting recently. Um, and the missions of these country projects are to uh, understand their surveillance procedures in country related to One Health and related to zoonotic uh, diseases, uh, to identify gaps uh, in reporting across sectors, um, and identify best practices and implement those best practices. And then, as I mentioned, um, using those lessons learned to uh, create a global toolkit that will be useful and will be effective uh, in countries. Um, so we visited uh, Tanzania uh, last year uh, in September um, to learn about uh, their express needs, their use of these two different tools, uh, both FAO tools and DHIS2 tools, um, and their current One Health infrastructure uh, in country. And we're also establishing um, those relationships with uh, government officials, local FAO uh, partners, uh, their HIPS country office, um, and the ministries that would be involved uh, in this work. And we learned uh, that uh, primarily that mainland is initiating their own One Health uh, surveillance platform. Um, and so that's something that we do not necessarily want to uh, interfere with. Um, we think that that is great. Uh, and so we will be supporting them in that. Um, but uh, Zanzibar did express um, more of a, uh, of a need for this data sharing and interoperability between uh, their uh, FAO and DHIS2 tools. Um, so in Zanzibar, we learned that those FAO tools uh, uh, and those FAO officers and animal health officers have been trained in those FAO tools, um, but they aren't necessarily systematically used uh, across the country. However, DHIS2 uh, is used um, throughout Zanzibar uh, for both human health uh, IDSR as well as some uh, zoonoses event-based surveillance. Um, and there is no formal communication across sectors. Um, so it is really that situation where it's all paper-based, it's phone calls. Um, and so something that they express the need to digitize those communications. Um, and that is mostly what led to, uh, to this project. So our HIST partners uh, there uh, just last week have uh, continued these uh, next steps um, with uh, mapping district and local level processes uh, for One Health surveillance and to understand the specific workflows uh, across sectors to be able to create a software that is uh, very useful for these folks. Um, and uh, understanding specific user interactions uh, with these different tools, of course, is very important uh, to develop a software that, uh, that will be useful uh, for them. Um, and once uh, pilot mechanisms for this data sharing across sectors are created, uh, it will be piloted there for feedback and for um, 
uh, integration into the, uh, the global toolkit. Um, more recently, uh, last month, uh, we had a multi-agency multi workshop um, with a lot of folks uh, in the room here um, and from, uh, from US CDC. Um, and we worked together to really conceptualize the use uh, and architecture of this toolkit, what the software should look like, what needs need to be uh, met. Um, and we are uh, currently working on uh, piloting mechanisms for information sharing uh, between these two tools. Um, and those can be seen here. The goals of these, uh, the goal within this workshop and, and the outcomes of this workshop develop two goals related to information sharing and with uh, data sharing. One uh, being, uh, goal one being signified uh, by the horizontal lines across uh, the community and subnational levels um, between uh, the two tools of, uh, of uh, FAO tools and the DHIS2 tools. Um, and this mechanism that all was already created by our developers, um, Stefano and, and Brian with our, our group and their team um, is that one directional data sharing event-based notification across sectors. Um, 12 minutes, oh. Um, and uh, the information that is shared within those notifications uh, is really the who, what, what animals are involved, what humans are involved, you know, what, what their contact information is for follow-up across sectors, what in terms of if it's a disease, if it's a test result, if it's uh, a single event, um, what the event is, um, and of course, where is important for jurisdictional follow-up, important uh, as well as uh, when uh, the event occurred. Um, and goal two, uh, signified by um, upwards reporting into this toolkit, into this module, is different from goal one in that it is you know, also data sharing, but it is bi-directional data sharing, and it is continuous throughout an investigation. Um, leading to a joint investigation between uh, human and animal health uh, sectors. Um, and that would be something that we're uh, working towards uh, in the future. Um, and so in addition to finalizing goal one and that unidirectional data sharing, um, we're also working to, uh, as I said, develop that bi-directional data sharing for joint investigations um, and leading to uh, overall toolkit development. Um, and uh, and working with country projects to pilot those uh, moving forward. Um, key takeaways for this, even if the countries that you know are in this room and not necessarily working on this on these country projects yet, um, key takeaways for them would be to start having those conversations across sectors, understanding what gaps there are in your One Health surveillance, and what data do you currently share, what data needs to be shared for the other sector to continue their investigations for a proper One Health surveillance uh, uh, response. Um, and that would really be something that would help your country, you know, prior to and when you, you receive this toolkit in the future um, to, uh, you know, implement that in country uh, effectively. That is all I have. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. So the next presenter following uh, a bit on the One Health topics will be Tofik from uh, ISPA Indonesia, going to present their experience on strengthening zoonotic disease surveillance at country level. Maybe just a logistic information, I think it was already uh, announced in the plenary session. So around 12, there will be a testing uh, from the Norway government about the alert system. So maybe everybody will receive uh, uh, an alert on the phone uh, can be very loud. We, we don't know if it will be at 12, 11, 50, or 12, 15. So in case uh, this will happen, uh, a way to avoid all this, uh, this noise will be to put to have the device on uh, flight mode. Okay, but just in case, don't, uh, don't panic. Is the, is the, the one, this one. Yeah. Thank you very much. I leave the floor to Tofik. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. No? <laughs> uh, 
think yes. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Taufik from Indonesia. I want to uh, share something about the uh, DCS2, especially for the surveillance program and uh, zoonosis. Uh, okay. You know, uh, we want to share about the zoonosis here, especially how we use DCS2 from national implementation and subnational level. Currently, we have the uh, since 2016, we received many support from uh, donors, especially how to establish the zoonosis one health condition, especially in Indonesia. Previously, 2016, we have a three uh, application from three ministries. We one is from the Ministry of Health, Ministry of uh, Agriculture, Ministry of the uh, uh, forestry, for example, this is the big area what we share something. Next, we escalate the features to integrate from three applications to be one application. We call it like CISA information system of genesis here. And uh, this is very important to uh, conduct the activities to help some uh, help them how to utilize data from animals information from animals information, uh, human health information, and another uh, application for purpose. So since 2018 something, we received some support from uh, one uh, from the uh, University of Oslo to implement zoonosis system. We collaborate with the University of Oslo to establish this as two to be main application as national system. This is very important. You have to know about the this is two in Indonesia is more to get data from uh, uh, facility level and uh, aggregate to national system. Then uh, we escalate. Since 2020 is difficult time for us, not only maybe for Indonesia but also for the globals. We uh, we trans we transform the existing zoonosis to be COVID-19 contact tracing. So it's very, very difficult to us to uh, implement for the genocide uh, application information system. And we establish uh, contact tracing is more bigger than than uh, than genesis, uh in terms of the storage, in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the application in that area. So the one thing is what we have now is uh, 2021, we uh, escalate not escalate, the scale up for the subnational levels. From the existing, from the previous genesis, we escalate to one subnational level. If you remember the Denpasar, this is the one city in Bali area because a number of the rabies is very huge there. So we escalate the genesis and the existing genesis to be main application in Bali area. This is the sample of the, uh, of the application. This is the genesis too. And uh, yeah, this is the samples. And uh, we use zoonosis here, not only for the Ministry of Health, but also uh, subnational level, including facility level. If you primary healthcare, primary healthcare, and another facility here. So, two hundred and sixty active users currently uh, doing some uh, zoonosis applications. What is the item or consist here? So there are eight dashboard covered to uh, eight use cases, especially from anthrax until uh, tenesis and uh, Christus sources. Sorry, I'm not a public health person, but it's the information. And uh, this is the sample what we uh, use here in separate area. We test and we escalate the number from the West Indonesia in Aceh province so Sulawesi in one city in Yogyakarta. This is the middle one of area. And we continue to, to have the local context from the Bali information system. So we have the metadata summary is including uh, more than 1,000 data elements, uh, 63 indicators, and uh, 13 program. And this is the, uh, the 
big uh, effort what we say here to align with the UIO. Sorry, the this is two global packets. This is the important two things we have to consider how the this is two global packets must be utilized for the local context for the sample languages. This is very important to us because you know the data elements uh, description, data elements uh, name, or for example, we have to convert to uh, local context, the local uh, like the local languages. This is very important to us. And this is the sample you can see from uh, data elements cover the ERS health facility, the point of uh, activities from the health facility, and also from the SO to be validated and uh, verification data. This is the data set. We have the nine data sets, including uh, Elisari, Rabies, Health Data Center for the uh, C CIML monthly report, and we escalated the numbers testing to the Bali area. And uh, you can see it's very huge number. The one thing from this is two in Indonesia, especially from Indonesia, the challenges is because we have the limited resource in terms of the public health. So our concern since last year, we utilize the person from the Ministry of Health, local university, for example, and uh, who has been concerned about zoonosis and public health, like environmental health, for example, we engage them to utilize the, our indicators, utilize the, our information to be uh, important to them, especially for the national level. This is very important too. And uh, you can see here, especially if you implement the global uh, toolkits like the data set or standardization, we have to translate for Indonesia. We have to utilize this, the important to us, especially trans translations from metadata is very, very crucial, especially for Indonesia or uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia context. This is the sample. If you see, uh, since 2019 on 2020, we have a plan to escalate to scale up the zoonosis application, especially in Indonesia, to be as the main applications from that area. There are a lot of organizations here. 34 provinces, more than 500 districts, 1,200, 12,000 facilities is mean the primary healthcare instead of uh, another, another organization use it. And we test for the uh, villages only 300 something like that. Uh, I can, this is the, you can imagine this is too, it's very big uh, implemented in Indonesia, but it's very difficult to have a, uh, the good one for the public health program rules. And we escalate for the Denpasar. Denpasar is the one city uh, in Bali. It's the big city, the capital city of Bali province. We implement Denpasar Info Responsible is the surveillance information system to be uh, active and uh, is very, very uh, good for the implementation right now, especially for the One Health. We utilize, uh, you can see this is the, the, the interface already changed from this is to uh, this is to user interface to be the local area as well. And this is the condition. This is the information we took from this is to especially number of rabies, especially in Indonesia. Uh, and every information should be utilized or converted to Indonesia number of the bites of the uh, rabies, uh, the animals type, for example, cases by gender, cases are positive from the uh, cases positive in humans is no, but you get the uh, trend of the finding of the rabies is very, very uh, good uh, enough to collect information and we transfer and we convert to the, the map point, for example, here. And what is the regulations we support? Especially in, in Denpasar City, we 
uh, establish some focus area, especially in the ESO, uh, we, about the frequency and controlling factor infections and zoonosis disease 2020 and 2024. There are four groups factor infected in zoonosis disease. One is about the malaria, DBD, zoonosis, including the uh, rabies, rodentia, anthrax, and avian, sorry, the flu burung is the avian flu, for example, here, leptospirosis, filariasis, and worm. This is the, the, the regulations, the local regulation has been supported by uh, Indonesia team. So next is about the genesis program in Denpasar. This is the sample from the start until how to utilize the data from uh, DSS2 and also uh, for the locals uh, DSS, uh, DSO level. In here, we utilize the information about the type of biter, specimen check, result and checking, dog population, animal vaccine, administrative, and rabies positive animal tracing. This is the most important what we can see the information and flow chart here. And the second, the big things from Indonesia is about the integration data. The integration data is like many applications has been support many years a long time ago from many many donors for example WHOs, usid the dfed for example they have a lot of applications and this is the our uh, our challenging to support how to integrate data between application between uh, system in, information system in specific area on that area in this context this is the sample we utilize the information system from rabies uh, this is two to routine surveillance activity uh, area or unit. Okay, I am. I think this is the enough for Indonesia. You can see the number and the uh, and you know this is two is more embedding and buy in 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 local context. Thanks everyone. Uh, over to Stefan. Thank you very much, Tofik, to share your experience for uh, uh, strengthening animal surveillance monolith integration in Indonesia. And now I would like to have here for the evaluation of the electronic case based surveillance system in Sierra Leone, our colleague. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I will leave the floor to Dongo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Like this. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk on something a little bit different. It's not an implementation of a system but this time an evaluation of a system. <laughs> uh, my name is Jojo Dongo. I'm a health scientist with the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, in the Division of Global Health Protection. So um, one of the roles that we do is to promote the division's goal, one of which is to um, help countries um, uh, collect data quickly utilize that data, analyze it, and uh, respond to disease uh, outbreaks, especially the epidemic prone disease. And we do this through working with uh, multiple countries, first of all, and then ministries of health, uh, in-country implementing partners, uh, and uh, if center like this one, uh, to kind of help them utilize what available tools in the country transform it to collect data quickly, uh, improve timeliness and completeness of data to, to, to achieve that um, goal. So I, I'm going to be brief. This is a presentation outline. And um, let me just give you a context uh, of the country. You have seen this ma map several times. If you do DHS2 online training, Sierra Leone is uh, map is often used. So I just want to give an impression of get give you an impression of what the health units in the country are. Uh, they have slightly over 1,400 public health units uh, with one 
National Public Health Reference Lab and some four, three or four regional referral laboratories and um, 208 zones. Uh, so <clears throat> why DHS2? Uh, as I said earlier, we used, we help countries use available tools that they're already familiar with. So in when we went to Sierra Leone, um, they had already started using DHS2, was introduced in 2008 as a health management information system for entering routine monthly, quarterly, and yearly aggregate data. They had some challenges, but uh, most importantly, after the, Ebola, the West African Ebola outbreak of 2013-2016, uh, we began seeing a lot of changes and the need for us to strengthen the system. So in 2016 to 2019, uh, through a cooperative agreement with mHealth, working in collaboration with other partners inside the country as well, we customized the national system for reporting weekly aggregated data for about 27 notifiable conditions. And that enabled transition from paper-based system to electronic reporting. This became kind of foundational for us to begin implementing case-based uh, disease surveillance system. A lot of African countries actually have some sort of uh, electronic reporting of aggregate data, either by phone, um, bit smart, or even the basic phone. But in Sierra Leone, we started using tablets for that. And uh, mHealth had uh, developed this custom application where you could send SMS in batches. And I think DHS2 has adopted that. I've seen implementations of that in several other countries. So in 2017, we introduced the first electronic case-based disease surveillance system using DHS2 tracker. This was based out of the South Africa uh, tracker template. Uh, we after the Ebola outbreak, CDC had a cooperative agreement with East South Africa, basically to transform and help uh, the Ebola affected countries in West Africa to improve on their data systems. So Sierra Leone happened to be one of those countries. And um, 2020, uh, when the COVID-19 outbreak uh, pandemic happened, we already, some sort of advantages of implementing the case-based disease surveillance system. And the country adopted it as a national system for the COVID-19 response, uh, mainly for case reporting, data management, and analytics. And uh, of course, integrating it later with uh, the <coughs> vaccine management system. So when WHO, I'm sorry, when ISP Center developed the generic package for COVID-19, Sierra Leone was actually far ahead. We did compare. We, we didn't need to customize anything. I'm not going to talk about this diagram. Those of you who are familiar with implementing tracker program uh, is basically the same concept, the notification stage, uh, then you go to the program stages and so on. So um, maybe the implementation milestones, I've already spoken about the adoption in 2017. In 2018, I, there was actually a massive announcements on the tracker system. And our first pilot implementation of tracker was actually in Uganda using the acute febrile illness. I uh, worked with the colleagues from East Center here in East Uganda. Uh, we did that first test and uh, I think kind of helped really improve the uh, functionalities, functionalities in the tracker system. Uh, around 2018, we started piloting. We, actually, we borrowed that concept and improved on the first implementation of the case-based disease surveillance system introduced in Sierra Leone in 2017. Then 2018, we improved it. We redesigned it a little bit, taking advantage of the Im improved functionalities, piloted it in four districts, about eight health facilities. Um, and then start planning rollout in early 2020, but was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We kind of delayed the rollout, but the system was being already, was, was adopted for COVID-19 response. But eventually we ended up rolling out nationally to hold the health, public health facilities um, between August of 2022, January, 2021. To date is being used and uh, for many other purposes, not only just um, 
uh, not if, not just for notifying events of national public health interest. Um, so I'm talking about evaluation. These were the objectives. We wanted to assess the extent of the integration of ECBDS in the country's disease surveillance program. Um, specifically wanted to determine uh, system, systems performance in the following areas, its usefulness, attributes, some few attributes. I, I need to state that this was not a very intensive uh, systems, health information systems evaluation. Neither was it um, a cost analysis evaluation. It wasn't an impact evaluation. It was more of a formative evaluation to help inform our implementation uh, uh, challenges and get ways of improving it. So we also tried to get the factors that are preventing and or facilitating in the integration through the investigation of people's processes and infrastructure. And then lastly, we wanted to know the role DHS to plays in the disease surveillance and opportunities for improvement, assessing the workflows and so on. <clears throat> um, I said earlier, this map is very familiar, but the colors you see here is not for training. It means something. We selected eight districts purposively based on their reporting rates, those ones who are doing well, those ones who are not doing well. And uh, in each of those eight districts, we selected five health facilities uh, that have consistently been using ECBDS and also dependent on their reporting rates between January to July of 2022, uh, trying to get an, a mix of high and low volume health facilities. We also reach out to four regional referral laboratories and one national health uh, and one national reference lab. And uh, our data collection was two methods. We did quantitative data collection using standardized tools at L facility level district and then the labs. And uh, qualitative, we conducted uh, key informant interviews at national and then districts. So this data collection happened in August of 2022. Uh, I'm going to talk about our findings, challenges, and then importantly, lessons learned. Uh, we There are a lot of findings. We wrote a big report, but I'm only going to dwell on a few that I feel are very important for, for, for this audience. Um, number one, um, in terms of human resource capacity, which they have been talking about in the plenary, uh, data use and infrastructure, uh, we are confronted with a situation early 20, 2020 before rollout. Uh, how do you train over 1,500 participants? Uh, we kind of adopted a three-tiered approach, uh, building capacity at the national level first, and then we brought districts to the regional level, and then the people we trained at the regional level cascaded that training to the health facilities. Now, uh, from our own assessment, uh, we went to Forte Health facilities and indeed majority of all the people we spoke with had benefited from a formal training. Um, some six said they, they did not train because the person who was trained was either on leave or was transferred or for some reason wasn't at the health facility that day, which isn't a problem. And then because we've trained the district health management teams a lot to help cascade this training to the health facilities, we actually realizing that empowering the district health management teams is, is a very good thing because uh, it's providing all the basic user support and on-site mentorships to health facilities to an extent that the health facilities, before they call the teams at the national level to address their concerns, they first reach the district health management teams, which are nearer to them and um, being very supportive. So that goes on to minimize our cost and time and so on. Um, in terms of data use, all the head districts that we spoke with, we actually got very rich qualitative data through the key informant interviews. All the head districts that we spoke with 
talked very highly about how the system, the alert notifications they receive help them as triggers to begin case investigations. Um, their work has been made very easy using the dashboards that we have built for them. Um, for generating reports, meetings, not only for health purposes, but maybe district-wide stakeholder engagement meetings and so on. Um, the infrastructure, yes, uh, Sierra Leone was lucky that after the Ebola, there were some significant funds that went to West African countries to strengthen up health systems. And um, Sierra Leone was lucky that uh, every health facility uh, got a tablet in that process and um, <clears throat> made it easier for us to kind of implement, uh, do the transformation for both aggregate and then the case-based disease surveillance. So um, in the 30, 39 health facilities that we found somebody to speak with, 39 are actively using the tablets. Seven are not just because the tablet is faulty or is lost, something like that. And uh, Somehow, power isn't power wasn't a very big issue and isn't a very big issue. Either those facilities were connected to the national grid, some use generators as backup, and I think through other investments, other programs, um, they, they managed to install solar systems in most of the health facilities. Um, internet coverage is not that very good. Uh, it is just coincidental that um, about half of the health facilities went to had really stable and strong internet, 18 reported weak or no internet. And those who reported no internet uh, is a mix between no internet at all. And then it's just because they have not received their monthly data for weekly reporting, case-based reporting. So the government through other collaborations on a monthly basis pushes data for internet in all these tablets. The issues with that, some receive, some don't receive, but at least the mechanism is there for them to receive data for internet. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is just a snapshot of the attributes. Majority of the people that we spoke with told us that ECBDS is easy to use for them. They're easily to navigate. Uh, we are a little bit worried that healthcare workers not having received a lot of training, which are computer-based, maybe having issues, challenges, and so on, but that proved not to be the case. Their form loads easily. We are not having challenges like uh, taking forever to download to load. Uh, they, they agreed that they learned it easily and confident using the system. Uh, other attributes we evaluated, but to contain them in the report, I just picked a few. Now, I picked this. Um, For some reason, this wasn't the graph. I, my colors are different. Anyway, <laughs> uh, look nice on my laptop, but so um, we wanted to see the timeliness. This is a key element. If our goal is to enable countries to report timely, how is the system helping the countries to send immediate notifications so that the national uh, headquarters are aware of what is happening in the remote areas. So we selected 146 notifiable medical conditions, analyzed them, and we compared it with the health facility registers. Uh, as much as they're using the system, the health facilities have main, still maintained a system of logging every event that comes to the health facility. So um, about 60% reported those events on the same day, which is good. Another 17% seven, reported those events between two to seven days, not bad. So overall, over 76% of the cases that needed to be reported were actually reported within seven days, majority of which were reported in the first two days, which is fantastic. And of course, uh, not everything was reported. Some four, four, four cases, which is 3%, were not yet reported at the time when we visited. Some few cases were reported after one month, those challenges happen. Um, then in terms of completeness of report, uh, completeness here is um, uh, the records, are uh, the records in the system, in the register, are they reported using ECBDS? So our completeness rate was at 77%. However, if you remove January, you know, issues, people are coming back from Christmas and so on. 
the completeness rate actually increases to over 80%. So generally there's consistent reporting using ECBDS. I, I want to rush through, I'm not going to go through these key challenges. This is very common, um, internet, power, staff, attrition. Uh, we still see disparities between health logs and so on, about 20% of that. Now, what lessons did we learn? Uh, ECBDS is playing a very important role as an integral part in the case-based disease surveillance system. There's instant or timely alert notification. It has streamlined the workflows. Uh, the districts, everybody in the hierarchy of surveillance know what to do and is a medium for data sharing. Um, L facility staff are very okay. They value, they understand the use of electronic tools. That wasn't a problem. And the capacities that we have built at the districts have really empowered uh, disease surveillance. And uh, importantly, empowering the districts to provide user support, technical support at the much more subnational level is a very important thing. It has alleviated a lot of uh, uh, reliance on the national team and turn, turnaround time. So uh, other factors that um, affect the use of digital tools in disease surveillance may not actually be at the health facility, neither individual. It's much more infrastructural or government policies. We have seen issues where they don't have a plan to maintain tablets or regularly supplying data for internet. And then another thing, as much as we build the information systems, they don't work in a vacuum. We realize that we need auxiliary systems in order to enhance ECBDS performance. We need a system for tracking tablets, for example, for tracking healthcare workers so that it informs government when they're transferring. Are you transferring a trained one or an untrained one? You need to replace with a trained one. But also, if you have transferred a trained one, then you need to go to back to that health facility and train one. And lastly, the ticketing system. This may sound a little bit uh, complicated, but it's very important to kind of keep track of the common issues that are coming from the health facilities. This way, it enables you to tailor your support to health facilities. And lastly, leveraging on other technological platforms like WhatsApp is playing a very big role. Uh, health facility staff are able to share their experiences, seek for support from peer support from one another. At times, even the district people told us they take a snapshot of their issue, send it through WhatsApp, so they're able to understand uh, what the issue is and respond appropriately. And uh, I, I think that's it. So uh, we worked with the Ministry of Health. They are great people, uh, Minister of Health Sierra Leone. Uh, our on the ground, capacity building IP, uh, AFNET doing a great job there. And then Health East South Africa is providing some kind of high level technical assistance to the in-country team. And my colleagues at uh, CDC, both in the country office and then um, at headquarters. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, George. So continuing in line with the event-based surveillance system, I would like to call here Raja Bumokwa for, presentive, um, for a presentation on a flexible and robust electronic event-based surveillance, a system for reporting monitoring events in Tanzania. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Is it okay? Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Rajabu Mkomwa. I'm a system developer. So unfortunately, I need to apologize. I may not be able to be a little bit of surveillance, but I'm, on behalf of, of my colleague, I'm presenting uh, the work that we have been doing uh, on improving uh, electronic EIDSR in Tanzania mainland, and that is event-based surveillance. So, um, in summary, oops. This is oh, oh, with the mouse. Okay. Oh, yeah. So uh, basically, from the Tanzania mainland, we already had started or had uh, developed uh, the electronic based surveillance. That by at the time was uh, based on indicator-based surveillance, collecting immediate and weekly data, at least to to, to support uh, a response. 
But lately, uh, uh, we started into now moving to event-based surveillance. So as a IDSR component, uh, the, the, the event-based surveillance was aimed at, oh, uh, at ensuring uh, reporting of unusual alerts or rumors that are happening in the community and that uh, to contribute towards uh, early warning and response. And in uh, mainland Tanzania, most of the alerts uh, have been noticed due to coming from community uh, health facility, for example, uh, unusual symptoms or uh, unusual lab results, so also points of entry, uh, but also from other sources around, uh, media scanning, call centers around. So Tanzania mainland has one 199 call center where public sends different messages around. Um, so as uh, just in a little bit of a background, which I said earlier, is that uh, until recently, we had no any of the event-based event surveillance component. We have a DSR system, but we did not have that. And most of the rumors were manually collected and hence was really not effective for AOR. But in uh, now 2021, uh, MOH Tanzania, of course, in collaboration with the DHIS2 team uh, and MDH, uh, with the funding support from CDC Tanzania, we have to acknowledge them. Also, one of the representatives is here. Uh, we started to implement the event-based surveillance, uh, so also to comply with the third edition guideline that we, we actually started to use uh, by that 2021. So basically, in summary, uh, in mainland, this is how the the component, this is just a component within EADSARA works. So as I said, uh, alerts can come from the community. We use community healthcare workers to report uh, different alerts, and they are reporting to the facility, the nearby facility within the catchment, and the facility are the ones that perform sort of uh, triaging and they verify whether those alerts are, are okay, and of course they notify the higher level. But also the, the, the alerts also can come within the district itself or the region or the national, or as I said earlier, also from the border health, but also from the call center. Now from the call center, there is another system in mainland that collects different messages and calls from public. So we have, been integ we have integrated uh, the event-based surveillance component too with the call center. But again, uh, the verified alerts are then uh, been linked or complements indicator-based surveillance. And then the uh, IDSR also handles the entire outbreak management. That also includes contact tracing, et cetera. Um, yes, moving on, well, what we have done for EBS is actually we have integrated it with the call center. So there's that message that the public can send if there's an issue uh, through SMS. And that uh, message is sent to EBS uh, component, but also for community healthcare worker or health facility workers, we use the Android application that is a uh, comprised of indicator-based surveillance, event-based surveillance, but also some of malaria case-based surveillance in one uh, application and then they can also use that to report. Or within the district or region or national, there is also a DHS2 custom app that is a web-based that can be used to report and handle all that uh, verification uh, and investigation aspect for, for EBS. Um, as just quickly, I think this is known to most of you, probably new to me, but uh, these are a key aspect for EBS that we are doing in the mainland. So there's a detection that comes from all those areas. There's triaging, actually ensuring we are filtering all duplicate or hoax alerts uh, in order to, to remain with the ones that matters. Uh, and also there's verification now to verify whether the, the alerts that have been filtered are, are really valid. This involves uh, the district uh, team to communicate with the facility or whoever that has reported to ensure if the alerts are valid and also the now performing investigation, which actually now that is where it provides linkage, linkage to indicator-based surveillance uh, cases. Um, so for achievement at the moment, uh, this has already been rolled out in six regions. 
And the uh, first pilot was conducted in, in Gorongoro. I guess we wanted to see some, <laughs> some lions. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, okay, okay, in the crater. We also welcome you guys uh, in the crater. So we, we made the first pilot in Gorongoro where most of the alert were around and most, most of them were really related to animals. So I guess that's why we started there. And uh, more like uh, more than 300 users were, were trained. And at least some more like 5,000 alerts have been reported uh, during this initial uh, rollout. So you can see our one of our CHW from Gorongoro. If you see this close, you will you'll know exactly where this comes from, uh, being taught how to use the Android application. Um, my presentation is very short. So in conclusion, uh, we see that e EBS has a potential for, for ensuring the timeliness in the outbreak detection uh, and the dissemination. Uh, uh, also, we are seeing that it has potential to support cross-sector data sharing. As you know, we are collecting the alerts. The alerts can be uh, of animal relation or environmental relation. So there is a potential for using this uh, uh, EBS to more likely uh, send notification or receive notification from other One Health uh, initiatives that are around. As I said, most of the alerts in Gorongoro uh, are based on animal related. So that pro this probably could be the case. Uh, so as for future work, I think it's the same as I was saying as a potential. Uh, also this uh, EBS or the entire IDESARA can sort of be integrated with the One Health initiatives around. Um, also, we are also looking into performing a national wide rollout because we, we, we rolled it out in only six regions, but also we, we saw a little bit of a gap in the data use. So also one of the future work is now to strengthen the capacity on reporting and using the data. Just to highlight in general, uh, the EBS is just as a component, as I said earlier, within the entire uh, robust and flexible EIDSRA ecosystem that now covers the indicator-based surveillance report, the, the, the cases that have been reported from the facility together with the event-based surveillance. And now we are now working or uh, finalizing the entire outbreak management uh, component within the IDSARA. So from the cases to now the potential outbreaks to handling of events, contact tracing, et cetera, all in one single ecosystem that uses DHS2. Um, I have to acknowledge and uh, my colleagues uh, from DHS2 Udism team, uh, also from the Minister of Health, uh, MDH, but also from CDC Tanzania. Uh, one of our colleagues is here, Mr. Zaharani. Uh, so, uh, Sante, I think. I'm there. Thank you very much. So unlikely we uh, have some technical issue with the last presenters. We'll not be able to join. So uh, let's see the bright part that we'll have uh, more time for any Q&A. So uh, if there is any questions, maybe I will invite the presenters to be here on stage with me so they can answer to the different questions. As well online, we can check if there are any questions. Don't be shy. Okay, we already have two questions. That's fantastic. Okay. Yeah, in case. Any question for? Yeah. That 
So thanks for the presentation. My question is on the, the last presentation on event-based surveillance uh, because it's my area with WHO. So, um, so you mentioned most of the rumors that you receive, uh, at least for the time being, is uh, animal-related. So once you collect that data from the Android phone, is there a way currently where you can relay it to the, to the uh, next level? because um, you said the triaging and verification is done by the community health worker. So most of our community health workers don't have training specifically for animal health related alerts. So I just want to know how you relay the, the, the alerts which are considered related to animal health it goes to the next level. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, thank you. I'll try to answer that <laughs> because I'm a developer. Okay, so basically from, from the Ngorongoro pilot, uh, most of alerts, uh, they're, they're human related alerts, but mostly come from animal diseases. So at the moment, we, uh, we do not have expertise really on animal surveillance. This is also only health surveillance. What I put in there is actually this has a potential for those alerts to now be to, to now be transferred to animal surveillance aspects so they can actually follow up on that. But on the uh, triaging verification and et cetera, uh, in my presentation, uh, the triaging is not done by the community health care workers. The community health care workers, their purpose is only reporting. The triaging are being done within the health facility that who's uh, the it's the catchment for those healthcare workers. So how it is done now is actually the alert is being reported. Health facility are trying to try to verify and investigate, and then they are notified uh, at higher levels. But we are, I think they, there are some initiatives to now link that to animal surveillance. So the other aspect of responding to animal can, can come, come up. I hope I answer your question. All right. Yeah, maybe too hard to the class because we had a presentation uh, on Monday about emergency in which Uganda showed the alert system in which the triage was done not at health facility level, for example, at district level. So uh, yeah, at, with protocols and uh, algorithm. So yeah, just to add on this, in case you are interested, there are all the presentation will be will be available. Thank you. So the next question. Okay. Um... Thank you very much. My question goes to George, um, the evaluation that you did in Sierra Leone for CBS. Um, if a country wanted to do a similar evaluation, are these tools available? Uh, can they have access to the tools and how would we go about that? The reason I'm asking is because Uganda has done a pilot of CBS, but we're at a stage where they are, we want to scale up, but everybody's advising that we need to do an evaluation of the pilot before we scale up. Thank you. So, yeah, we can take a second question and then. Um, thank you uh, very much for the presentations. Uh, my question goes to Sarah Riwon. Um, on the timeliness of reporting, I saw that it's still low. Uh, the proportions are very low on timely reporting. And I was like, what was the reason uh, behind the uh, low reporting rate, a timely reporting rate? And uh, what is it that uh, you have recommended to improve uh, your work so that we have the uh, people to report timely? Thank you. Let's start with two questions to answer, then we take others, okay? Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, the first one was about the availability of tools. Um, thank you. Um, I, I know about the ECDS uh, implementation in Uganda. I was part of it. I have a very good history of that. Uh, the tools that we use, the concept was developed out of CDC frameworks. One a framework for evaluating uh, program evaluation, and then the other one for evaluating um, information systems for 
um, disease response. So we developed our tools from scratch, but based on those frameworks and borrowed ideas from other subject matter expertise and other countries as well. So uh, we actually shared this with one of the countries in Eastern Asia. And uh, I, I think we are in the process of developing a much more standardized data collection tool for this. And on top of that, there are also lessons that we have learned during the, the evaluation itself, which will make us also improve on the tools. So I think uh, me working with Uganda as well, uh, this should be easily shareable with you. <laughs> and there's no problem with that. So we have something to share. Thank you. Uh, the, the second question was um, the reasons for low completeness. Uh, did you use low? Oh, and, okay, okay. Let me explain that. So uh, that was on timeliness. Uh, how quickly were they reporting uh, the medical conditions? They reported. 60, about 60% 60 on the same day, 17% uh, within one week. Those are two to seven days on the second day to seven, which is still not so bad. And then only 3% were not yet reported at the time we conducted this evaluation. And uh, some part, the balance were reported within a month. It varied. So the reasons, as, it, as you saw, even answering the low completeness rate, uh, there was a factor in January. People are on leave. They are trying to regain their momentum, the rhythm after Christmas. If you remove January, which was kind of an outlier, all these rates go up. Yeah, as I demonstrated on the completeness, it's about 77%. But if you remove January data, you have a completeness rate of over 80%, which is kind of average, African-wide. I've read review some manuscripts and so on. Every country is grappling with completeness rate of between 80 to a good case scenario, about 95%. So it's not really low. It's, it's within normal. Hmm. Warren, on the notification you know of medical conditions for us we've <laughs> we, we we want them to be reporting within 24 hours yes yeah it, it depends on what is the problem of yeah yes. so now if they take seven days for me i think it's um it's on the lower side uh, and if they go beyond seven days it's a uh, i feel like it's not good enough. So we expect the best. Right, thank you. Um, I do think as I explained to you about the January factor, I, I do think uh, because probably our disaggregation uh, was two to seven days, if we split it up to within 24 hours, I, I think I will be able to present it better that way. So I think, uh, yes, it's still not 100%, but it's also not bad. <laughs> Thank you everyone for all the presentations. And it's great that we have multiple sessions for like surveillance and you know public health emergencies and everything. So my question would be to Bill, um, talking about the one health aspect. You know, we've talked about sharing data across sectors um, and what you presented sounds great. I'm just wondering like, what does that look like within a country at, you know, on the ground in, in the level where these actions are going to happen? Does that mean it happens at the national level and data if the systems are integrated, does that mean there's information sharing? Does, does the information go to like um, a data warehouse or health information exchange and then people are given access? Does that mean animal sector has access to the human sector, DHIS2 instance where the data are and they can look at or, you know, I'm kind of like, and then at what, like, how is the information shared in reality? How does it happen? And then at what levels does that happen? Does it only national level and then stuff has to trickle down or can it happen at district level or? So can you describe kind of like what it would look like in, in reality or on the ground? Thanks. That we've been grappling with uh, recently, especially in this last uh, workshop um, with all agencies involved in this. Um, but mm -hmm. the mechanism that we have currently developed at that workshop and that we're working on now, that unidirectional mechanism would be within 
either a, a uh, initial user of a community level user of DHIS2 or uh, EMAI, which is uh, the event-based reporting tool that reports up to Empress I in the animal health sector. Um, it would just be a checkbox in their current reporting documents. And then with that checkbox, it would be something along the lines of, is this a, a zoonotic disease that needs to be reported to animal health sector or human health sector, whichever is the, the opposing sector in that. Um, and it would be instantaneous. So it would be a notification, a one-time notification to that sector with the information that is in that document or whatever information is, is requested. And that's something that's modifiable by countries with that mechanism, uh, if that makes sense. Um, and the bi-directional notification would be different in that it would be something that would be a live kind of module for at a country level for both sectors to access. It's a lot more complicated, especially with data use restrictions, um, sharing restrictions, things like that within a country. It's going to be different from country to country. But the goal of that would be to have something where if there is a suspected case, one notification's out and then to that one module. And then if there's a test result of that same suspected case that confirms or denies, right, that wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be multiple notifications across the sector in different um, at different times, but it would be one platform that can be continuously accessed um, by, uh, by the opposing sector. And, and both uh, uh, animal health and human health officers at the community level would be able to access that. That would be ideal, um, but that's a lot more complicated and that's something that we're working towards. But right now that unidirectional one-time event-based notification across sectors is something that it is the lowest hanging fruit in this instance, so to speak, um, and something that that is a mechanism that has been created and will be piloted for for feedback um, and uh, hopefully using that to to work towards that that second goal. Thanks for your question. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a really good question and also why CDSC is helping us to support some pilots, but we also did some landscaping. And there's a bit around the, the DHIS2 side that even if you saw in these other event-based scenarios, it has to fit into that country structure. So who is trained and who should receive? Because there's a very real risk that you are inundated. You're just inundated with information and then you can't act on it. So I think within DHIS2, the idea is that then that needs to go to the designated focal point. But first, there also needs to be that process of defining what actually constitutes an alert that it should actually go to the other sector. Um, and I think, you know, where a lot of countries are, they have stronger DHIS2 or electronic indicator-based surveillance systems. And I think the event-based surveillance systems as, as presented in Tanzania are just now starting to really get up off the ground in, in a digital way. So I think at least from the DHIS2 platform perspective, we are seeing this work in a way that it can be just sharing information. It can actually send data to different systems. And we have also seen in some architectures such as in Burkina Faso, it's a, very, it's a flagship initiative of, of um, USAID. So a lot of like funds went into that system where they actually had three DHIS2s, actually they had four. So they had Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of um, Animal and Livestock, uh, Ministry of uh, Environment, Ministry of Health. And then they all kind of shared their data to an overarching one but that was at an aggregated level. So I think there's many architectures that we want to continue looking at to see, at least on uh, my DHIS2 hat on, how can we support them in multiple ways? Uh, sorry, I'm not adding on to that question, uh, but uh, to my sister who asked that question. One of the reasons that I thought I should tell you and uh, I forgot was um, for cases that were reported late, uh, apart from the January being an outlier, where that at that time when the case came to the health facility, they were lacking data for internet. But that doesn't mean the case never found its way to be reported. In that situation, they were using, they make a phone call to the district health official to come and uh, investigate the case. But uh, this uh, timeliness of reporting are based of when they reported on the system. But if, they didn't have data for internet at that particular moment, they would call the district officials, health officials to come and investigate the case. Thank you. Yeah, we still have one minute for one last question. It's really short, sharp question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Tomeka from Oahu. 
West African Health Organization. And my question are going to the the presenter of from CDC because I I was uh, uh, happy to see the the tools the proposition of that uh, One Health uh, surveillance tool you are proposing to do uh, since 2017 after Ebola crisis in West Africa we have been trying to put develop some kind of the uh, integrated epidemiological surveillance between human and animal health but we have been using. DHS2 under the uh, human surveillance to incorporate, if I can say that, the, the animal health, trying to respect also what they have been doing with the, the animal health organization, uh, world organization, not to avoid the work. But seeing this uh, integrated work we are trying to do, I think it's very good. Uh, sorry to confirm me, if the workshop coming on next last week in West Africa, will be based on these tools or not? Because I know so the CDC are organizing with ECOWAS, uh, Wahoo, on uh, last week of June, one workshop on the uh, One Health tools for the, for the surveillance. I just want to confirm if it's the same tools or if other initiatives also are going parallel in, in, in CDC. I think I got, I got that. Uh, par parallel initiatives um, would be the, the short answer to that. Um, par parallel initiatives would be the short answer to that. Um, that the, there are uh, parallel initiatives. Like, um, so so that isn't necessarily uh, like no, no one from our team, I don't believe, is, uh, is going there with these same tools of, at that workshop that you're talking about later in June, right? I think these are parallel initiatives that are uh, taking place. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So thank you very much for uh, for the participation. Thank you very much for our speakers. And yeah, in case there are any other questions, you can uh, tackle them. Thank you very much.